Hi, welcome back to another episode of SEO on Air. I'm your host, Aaron, and today we have Christopher Jones, the founder of LSEO. We talk about the challenges of building and scaling a business, the significance of backlinks for different companies, and some tips and tricks on how to do growth marketing. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Was you kind of featured on a TV show, I think, Planet of the Apps? What kind of, yes, what is the whole story behind that? Yeah, uh, total unexpected. Long story short, my whole career, my whole life, which my career has been 25 years long, um, but there's been a number of things that have happened in my life that were unexpected and um, I never in a million years thought would have happened. I didn't intend them to happen. Um, it, they just happened. And one of which was this idea that I was cast on a reality TV show back uh, about five years ago, six years ago, called Planet of the Apps. It was Apple TV's first uh, uh, original content show. Uh, and it's, it was even before um, Carpool Karaoke. So it was really their original. It was a mix of uh, Shark Tank, The Apprentice, um, uh, and The Voice. And, and, and so basically what it was, was a competition uh, amongst entrepreneurs for the uh, prospect of pitching your business in front of some top venture capitalists. So my partner and I had an idea to create an entertainment booking platform called Special Guest. And my partner just so happens to be a celebrity. He's a comedian and an actor by the name of Damon Wayans Jr. He's been on a number of popular TV shows like New Girl and Happy Endings. And he's been on a number in a number of movies like Big Hero 6, Let's Be Cops and others. But anyway, so Damon and I got cast on there. Uh, we made it uh, to the end of the show um, and we ended up raising $1.5 million US on the show. Um, we got to partner with uh, Will I Am, uh, who is a musician and an entrepreneur. He's famous from the Black Eyed Peas. Uh, but the other coaches were Gary Vaynerchuk, uh, Gwyneth Paltrow, and Jessica Alba. And so it was cool. I mean, you know, I, I, I dude, I, Aaron, I was like, for the first, you know, almost 10 years of my career, I was focused on building this SEO and affiliate company called Pepper Jam, which I'm sure we're going to talk more about. But that had become so successful, and I had an exit of that company uh, in 2009. Um, and and that once I had accomplished that, and obviously I made a considerable amount of money from that transaction, um, it just opened up so many opportunities in my life as an entrepreneur, as a digital marketer, you know, um, as a consultant, those kind of things. And yeah, the TV show, uh, being on it, watching myself. Uh, on television. And I remember back then they were doing commercials on national television. And it just so happened that when they released the show, um, or at least our episode, which was episode four, um, it was going on during the NBA, the basketball playoffs. And so, you know, everybody's watching the NBA playoffs and a commercial with my partner, Damon and I w was literally on national television promoting you know, the TV show. So it was pretty cool. Um, I'm really not someone that's interested in, in per se being a celebrity or being on television. Uh, I have been on television a number of times. Just most recently, I had my own TV show for, for two years on PBS, uh, talking about entrepreneurship and business. Uh, but generally speaking, it's just, I, just by virtue of being as successful as I, I, I've been and having done it at such a young age, it just opened up so many doors to raise additional venture capital, which I've done uh, to the tune of you know tens of millions of dollars. And I've worked with a bunch of celebrities and professional athletes and influencers over the course of my career. And while um, glorious as it sounds, the career has been, um, I think to maybe put a little bit of a reality spin on it, could you, Lee, could you give us some of the challenges that you kind of went through this entire time and maybe how you kind of overcame those challenges? So my whole life has been dedicated to personal and professional development. What that means is that I believe that life is, is a continuous process of improvement and self-education. You know, from the start of my career, I was uh, a graduate school student and then I went to law school. And uh, during those years, um, I learned entrepreneurship. 
you know, I learned, uh, I was always, I've always been obsessed with why certain businesses and entrepreneurs succeed and others fail. So, so to answer your question, Aaron, um, you know, not only have I faced, you know, setbacks and hardship and challenges over the course of my career, um, but I expect those things as part of life, as part of what is required to be successful. You know, resilience and the ability to pick yourself up when something goes wrong is actually more important than what went wrong. So there have been so many things over the course of my life. When, when I, uh, you know, when I think about this question, um, we almost have to like look at a certain point of time in my life and say, you know, what were some of the challenges at that time? Because challenges are, are, are always uh, in play. And the, and the other thing I'll say real quick is that, you know, I grew up poor in, in here in the States, uh, single mom, uh, you know, uh, and here in the United States, we call them double blocks, which is like an apartment building. You know, I, I lived in that. And um, I always knew what it was like to struggle and to, you know, not have a lot of uh, power or, or money. Um, and as I grew older and became more and more successful, I also got to see what it's like on the other side. You know, when you, when you have access to, to money, when you have influence in your community. Um, and so I guess throughout my life, I've always been very proud of how resilient I am when things go wrong. And so um, no matter what happens to me, uh, in fact, Aaron, no matter what happens to you or anyone who's, who's listening to this, um, no matter what happens, you're going to be okay. You're going to be okay. And that's, that realization it, to me means everything. So it, it almost doesn't matter what comes my way and what challenges I have or what I have to overcome. Cause I truly believe in my heart that, um, everything's going to be okay. So, um, you know, if you have any specific questions, I could talk about how I resolve them. You know, you're only as good as the people you're around. And in every success or, pick, you know, you know, picking myself up after, you know, something went wrong, you know, there has to be a mention of the people that are around me, the people that have helped me, um, you know, whether it be my, my uh, teammates at LSEO.com or one of my other companies, you know, they're, uh, if you have good people around you, it's a lot easier to kind of pick yourself up when something goes wrong. You kind of brought up Pepper Jam. I think that was one of your first actual ventures, let's say. So could you give us a bit of briefing about that and where it is now today? So Pepper Jam is a company that I founded in 1998, um, long time ago. Uh, what is that? 24, 25 years ago. So initially, it was in the late 1990s. And for historical context, that was really what was called sort of the dot-com uh, bubble. It was when there were so many dot-com companies. But my point of view on it was that I thought the internet was going to change the world. I was in graduate school at Villanova University in Pennsylvania at the time studying experimental psychology. But I, I was starting to take an interest in um, IPOs in the stock market and, you know, investing in those internet IPOs. So I was really bullish on how the internet was going to change everything. So my brother, Rick, um, you know, reached out to me and he said, you know, Chris, you keep talking about how the internet's going to change the world. Why don't we, why don't we start a business online selling our grandmother's gourmet food product? It was called, she actually called it Mississippi Mud. Long story short, we renamed it Pepper Jam. Um, I agreed right. with Rick that we would start that business. And my role in that business was to create an online presence. So I, I taught myself how to build websites. Um, once I figured that out, what was important was to actually get eyeballs on the website. So traffic generation. And so some of the industries that I'm obviously now considered an expert on I had to self-educate. So search engine optimization, it was the very early days of it. Um, Pay-per-click marketing, it was it, at the time, the leading platform was called goto.com, which later became Overture and then Yahoo. 
Um, and this was several years before Google AdWords even yeah. existed. So anyway, I self-educated and ironically uh, taught myself uh, affiliate marketing uh, because that was one of the ways. Now, once you generate traffic, the next step is to figure out how to monetize that traffic. And so in those early days, we were selling a gourmet food, but there were we were preparing that gourmet food for you know distribution across the country and e-commerce and that. And so um, I basically taught myself how to build websites, generate traffic, and then monetize that traffic through uh, affiliate marketing. And as I already said, I would generate the traffic through SEO and early pay-per-click marketing. Well, almost accidentally, I am, ended up building a, a, an, an early digital marketing company. So I was one of the first uh, people here in the United States to create an agency, which I called Pepper Jam, um, which would go on to be one of the largest uh, agencies of its kind in, in the United States. And so I kind of let my brother take the gourmet food company. I focused on the digital marketing company, Aaron. And over the next eight, nine years, I built that into one of the largest, um, you know, uh, affiliate and SEO companies. By 2008, uh, we launched some technology uh, called Pepper Jam Network, which went on to become one of the largest affiliate networks in the world. Uh, by 2009, uh, we were acquired uh, by then publicly traded GSI Commerce. Uh, yeah. For those that are listening that might not know who that is, it was owned at the time by Michael Rubin, who was one of the owners of the Philadelphia 76ers, and he's um, now the uh, owner of Fanatics. Um, and then shortly thereafter, we were acquired by eBay. And so my company was renamed from Pepper Jam to eBay Enterprise. Um, and went on for many years uh, as eBay Enterprise uh, after I had left. After I left, which we could talk about, um, I started an investment fund. And again, we could save that. But um, my partner, Mike Jones, ended up succeeding me as the CEO of Pepper Jam. Pepper Jam, over the last 10 years, it still exists. They have offices around the world. Um, the... Uh, the company went through a number of different owners. It was owned by private equity. Now it's owned by, I believe, a, a, a UK-based company. Um, but it, it continues on to be one of the most influential and largest uh, affiliate marketing companies in the world. Pepper Jam wasn't like a one-off thing with you as well. I think there were four or five other companies as well that you kind of started off and are still running successfully. Yeah, to, to understand that real quick. so. I sold the company in 2009. In 2010, I started an investment fund uh, called KBJ Capital. KBJ right. Capital is just my initials, Christopher Brian Jones. Uh, I've, I started it with my, my own money, the money, part of the proceeds from the Pepper Jam sale. Um, I've made over 40 investments um, over the last 13 years, um, you know, mostly early stage tech. Six of those companies I founded or co-founded. Um, I would uh, I've raised, as I already mentioned, you know, tens of millions of dollars in venture capital from top uh, VCs in the Silicon Valley, and um, you know, I've you know, and just to give you a sense of what some of those companies do. Um, once my non-compete ended with Pepper Jam, it was it was a five-year long one. So if you do the math, 2009. I started LSEO.com in 2014, five years later. And, um, and so that's one of my portfolio companies. Um, uh, another one is called MerchBooth.com, which is owned by a special guest, which I mentioned earlier from the reality TV show. Um, I, own, uh, I own a pretty large technology accelerator called the Accelerator at Wilkes-Barre, AccelerateRWB.com. It's about 35,000 square foot of uh, office space for growth stage technology companies. Um, that's what folks that can see my background. Um, I'm here on the fifth floor of the building that I own, um, overlooking our downtown here in Wilkes-Barre, Scranton, Pennsylvania. So yeah, dude, I, you know, I've, I've, I've dabbled in a lot of different things. So sometimes it's hard to interview me because it's like, well, what the heck do we focus on? 
it, tur it turns out that your background is in digital marketing. And truth is, despite having success across a lot of different companies, investing in companies, advising companies on growth strategies, the truth is my most uh, longest and most consistent skill since the beginning of my career is search engine optimization. And more broadly, I refer to it as growth marketing. So we, you know, as, as an agency at LSEO, we try to help our clients think through, you know, how to generate greater online visibility, you know, how to generate, um, you know, more web mobile traffic, you know, how to generate, you know, more response, whether that be leads or, or transactions. So, um, you know, we could certainly talk more about venture capital and investing in startups, you know, mergers and acquisitions. I actually have had several additional uh, exits since Pepper Jam. Um, so it's kind of been like my profession to, 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 to uh, invest in companies and or found those companies, scale them and eventually exit to someone uh, that is willing to, to acquire the business. If I am someone who, let's say, have I have the capital to invest and I have a few ideas that, or at least a few examples that I would like to invest in. Um, I have a little bit of belief that they can turn out well and I want to kind of push it forward. What would be, let's say, your advice to kind of know for certain if it's a good investment or not? What I've learned is that ideas tend to be overrated. Uh, over, overrated. They're, they, ideation, uh, you know, this, this is what is kind of like people are intoxicated by coming up with an idea that's going to somehow become the next big thing. My advice to you would be to focus more on the team and the founders. Um, you know, the question that I ask myself before I make an investment is, is this entrepreneur or these entrepreneurs going to be successful with or without me on this idea or a future one? Um, and if I conclude that they will be uh, successful with or without me, I'm, I, I'm inclined to make the investment. And the reason is, is because 25 years of experience, um, I'm very well networked within a, a number of communities, the technology community, the digital marketing community, the venture capital community. And if, if it's a young entrepreneur who I, I really believe is going to be successful with or without me, um, I bet you I could, I could accelerate their likelihood of success and I could increase the likelihood that, um, that they're even more successful, uh, than they may have been without me. So that would be my advice. And what are some, let's say, red flags I should look out for when investing in any agency or company? Uh, you know, one of the things that's a red flag for me, Aaron, is when the entrepreneur is so focused on the material uh, uh, impact that they might have in their life if they're successful. So they, there was this one investment that I had made. The guy was just obsessed with other entrepreneurs who had, like, you know, flew a private jet or you know owned an apartment in Manhattan or whatever. And and that that's a red flag because the truth is the successful entrepreneurs, you know, the money side is, is nice, but it's not what most of us are actually driven by. You know, we, we, our why is in solving problems. Our why is in driving efficiency into processes that we may see as inefficient. You know, our why is on resilience and being able to persevere in the face of you know, uh, people who don't think you could accomplish something. So if, if I'm, a, if I'm considering an investment and the person is just so glamorized by, you know, the wrong thing, material possessions, that's a red flag. And okay, let's say I have now found out this is a good company to invest in. I put in some money there. Um, I'm trying to now make a decision whether or not I should kind of get more hands on with the company or take a backseat and let them do what they are professional at doing. Will this be based on a situation basis or is it just better to kind of hang back? I actually think this is one of the best questions I've ever been asked as it relates on this topic. Um, <laughs> if you make an investment 
you best believe that you could add value, that you could step in if needed and um, help the company be successful. So I'm inclined to suggest that you want to offer your, your support. Now that said, you know, um, you should stay focused in the area that you're an expert. So in your case, it really, you, the, if you were to make investments, angel investments, you really should be giving advice on search engine optimization, et cetera. If you've never right. gone through the mergers and acquisitions process, you probably shouldn't be giving advice on that. I have, so that is one of the one of the key areas that I could offer advice to. But no, dude, I'm inclined to want to help, but stay within my niche of expertise. Okay, and um, if my expertise does, let's say, have an interest in those fields, in the sense that I might not be an expert in this field that I am acquiring, um, but I do want to get interested in that. At that level, when I'm in just an investor, should I even get involved at that point? Or should I do my own little personal educational stuff and then maybe consider it? That's a, that's another really solid question. I think you have to use, like, look at like AI as an example, at least LL, like uh, the language learning models and the generative AI, which is really, AI has been around for a bunch of years, but what's popularized it is the consumer application of language learning models. But anyway, um, honestly, mainstream, it's only been around for about eight months, nine months. So, you know, I, I personally think I'm an expert on it, but there's probably other people who know more. So I think you have to use your instinct uh, on whether or not, you know, you need to really focus and learn something before you can invest in it. Or, I mean, a lot of investors, we use our our instincts, you know, like, do we think that, um, you know, cryptocurrencies are the next big thing? Do we think that, you know, uh, driverless vehicles and automation around driving is the next big thing? Do we think that, you know, augmented reality are the next big thing? Do we think that artificial intelligence and particularly generative AI is the next big thing because it's going to drive efficiencies into uh, business that would have required hiring lots and lots of people. So um, it's, there's a lot of different, a lot of different things going on. And part of what you need to do is use your instinct to say, you know what, I don't really think that augmented reality is, is going to have the mainstream type of appeal that a lot of other people think it's going to have. I'm going to, I'm going to stay on the sidelines there, but with um, generative AI now, I'm using it. I'm driving efficiency into my business. I really think that this is going to disrupt in a positive way the way people do things. I only have a couple of months of experience with it, but I'm inclined to invest. See, I'm using my instincts as well as like, you know, whether or not I think I could actually, um, that I know enough about the industry to really get involved in it. It's tough though. You know, it's um, the final thing I'll say on that is like, you know, I've, I've spent time with, like, I'm not a full-time investor. I'm a full-time entrepreneur. There have been times over the last 10 plus years of my life where I probably was more of an investor, but I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. I'm here. I'm at, in my accelerator, I'm at LSEO, uh, special guest merch booth is downstairs. Like I'm here helping these businesses grow and scale. I've spent time with full-time investors people who are so successful and so well-known and so well-respected for what they do. Um, in those instances, those type of investors are using a lot of, uh, they have access to a lot of information. They have teams of analysts who are doing all of the due diligence, all of the work. That's not what I do. All of the investments that I've made were based on my own judgment, using my own money, um, and I was willing to lose that investment. And many times I have lost it. Other times I've made significant returns on my investment. How do you manage to kind of keep going through year after year for more than 25 years in the industry, pushing yourself to find good acquisitions and mergers, help them out, find good places to kind of invest in as well? I, I, yeah, the, the very amateur question you know would what? be just how do you do it? <laughs> 
Yeah. So what I've learned is that, you know, when I had no influence, you know, I, when I said, I, you know, I didn't have any money, you know, I had a single mom, you know, we didn't, you know, no, nobody was coming to me, you know, offering me opportunities. Um, I was, I, I worked hard. Um, I associated myself with good people during the years that I grew Pepper Jam. But ultimately, you know, I was in my late 20s when I sold the company. And all of a sudden, you know, and during those years, you know, all of a sudden I had more influence. You know, um, I never would have thought, Aaron, that I would have been an author. You know, as a, as a teenager and as a kid, you know, you, you kind of dream that maybe one day, well, I wrote my first book on search engine optimization in 2008. So I was just, I was in my twenties. I was just, you know, I was basically just a young adult, you know, um, that book as, uh, it was called search engine optimization, your visual blueprint to effective internet marketing. My publisher was Wiley, which is one of the world's largest publishers. That mm -hmm. book would go on to sell over 100,000 copies. Um, one of the best, if not the best selling SEO book of all time. That's crazy. I never expected that to happen. Some of it's just right place, right time. And actually when that when they came to me, so the, the publisher came to me and said, will you write this book? I, me? I was like, me? You sure? I'm like, I'm not even a visual learner. And, and the series was called Visual Blueprint. So there's a lot of like visuals in that book. Anyway, wrote it. And as I said, it would go on to sell over 100,000 copies, was published several times. So 2008, 2010, and 2013, just editions, edition one, edition right. two, edition three. And then last year, um, I know it was another one of your podcast uh, guests, a good friend of mine who I've known since the beginning of my career, Bruce Clay. Uh, Bruce Clay and I are friends and you know we do calls regularly and I was like, you know, I should probably do another edition of SEO Visual Blueprint. He's like, why? He's like, why don't you just co-write uh, Search Engine Optimization All-in-One for Dummies, which was the book that he had started years ago. And he said, why don't you just come on as my co-author and you could be the co-author of that. I was like, a dummy book? I'm like, holy cow, this is crazy. So I, um, you know, uh, Bruce, yeah. my buddy Bruce and myself, uh, last year, um, we published this in February. So anyway, to answer your question, in the early days, it was hard. It, you know, now people reach out to me almost daily saying, hey, I have a startup, sometimes multiple times a day, you know, and they they want advice, you know, they, they want me to give them feedback. In some cases, they want me to make introductions for them. Other cases, they want me to invest. But it wasn't always like that. And I think like any career, you know, the the better reputation you have, the more success you have, you know, success breeds success. But to your point, it is intimidating. It's hard. It's even hard when you have the influence like I have. It's but isn't life. You know, I think I think one of the things I'm trying to teach my kids is that, you know, whether or not you think you can or you can't, you're right. So in other words, if you could build up confidence and, and believe in your capacity to be successful in whatever it is that you want to be successful and you're willing to work hard, you're willing to put the time in, you're willing to accept and adapt to failure and setbacks. Um, and if that becomes who you are as a person, you know, uh, you're going to have a lot of success in your life. And as you get older and and hopefully more successful you'll also have more influence and 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 that's at the end of the day what what has happened to me um and by the way i've done this what my career has been in northeastern pennsylvania in the united states uh this is not what most people would would consider to be um you know a bustling you know technology and e-commerce hub um, in fact, when I founded Pepper Jam many years ago, um, people didn't even understand, you know, what we were doing, but it turned out later on that we would become one of the largest employers in this area. And there are a lot of other, uh, internet and technology companies, including many of them that are here in my building. So just got a Tony Robbins, who's one of the guys that, um, I've, I've focused on learning from. 
he is a, a personal professional development expert. He, um, he has this mantra where he says, um, uh, every day in every way, I'm growing stronger and stronger. You know, every day in every way, I'm growing stronger and stronger. So it's like, that's my philosophy on life is like, I might have some setbacks today, but I'm just going to pick myself up. I'm going to continue on. And um, who knows what the future holds? The reality TV show, which is how we kind of started this podcast is silly. Like, you know, um, you know, I don't know. I don't really want to be on another reality TV show, but who knows what my next, you know, experience or accomplishment is going to be. I can tell you this. I believe in my capacity to do just about anything. I just, I believe in myself. Doesn't mean that I'm the best at it. It just means that I've, I'm ready for whatever opportunities come my way. I think some people might be hearing all of this, wondering that, okay, cool. Maybe this is because you are um, saying yes to every opportunity that comes your way, while some might be bad opportunities that are the ones that are good and they stick. Um, but is there kind of like a mindset going into this at, from that age, at least? that any opportunity could be the opportunity and you should be, let's say, as optimistic as you can with everything? Or is there like a level of realism involved where you actually have to analyze each opportunity? You oh, get? absolutely. No. So, so realism for sure. In fact, um, about 12 years ago or so, I was speaking at a conference in New York City, the Tiger Global Internet Conference. And... Uh, the keynote speaker was Malcolm Gladwell, who is an author of a number of business, very, very, um, you know, best-selling business books. And, and Gladwell was sitting at the table at my speaker table, but he went up to give the keynote and there were about 300 of us in the audience. And he said, America, the world really kind of has entrepreneurship right and wrong. He said, um, they're right that successful entrepreneurs and he underlined he's like successful entrepreneurs are social risk takers what that means is that we are willing to kind of like have an idea and go after it even if people tell us we're crazy we're cool with that and that's true that's true that's what we do he said but what the world has wrong is that successful entrepreneurs are operationally risk averse and I couldn't, when he said it, I was like, holy shit, that is partly why I'm so, so successful. Very calculated, very thoughtful, very uh, meticulous, you know, very careful in detail about the investments I make, where I spend my time. Again, I had an exit fairly early in my life and I'm so grateful for it. But one of the things that allowed me to do, Aaron, was a lot of people are like, you know, what's the return on investment? How much money did you spend? A long time ago, I changed ROI to ROT, return on time. That's why you see me fishing with my kids. It's why you see me traveling to Costa Rica twice a year. It's why you see me doing really, really cool stuff. I'm going to a concert tomorrow night. I'm going to another one on Thursday night. So if, and again, it's easy for me to say, and I get it. People are listening probably like, oh, that's because the guy sold his company to eBay. But the truth is my heart has always been driven by work-life balance and by a desire to have experiences. Like earlier in my life, when what my best friend still, one of my best friends still to this day was my business partner at Pepper Jam. His name is Mike Jones. Same last name as me, but we're not related. We grew up together. Very intelligent, um, you know, did so well in, in college and law school and all this. Such a smart guy. I remember when we were teenagers and in our 20s, you know, I dreamt of like material success and like, you know, maybe one day I'll be able to do this. He's like, Chris, he's like, success is all about experiences. Right. And at that time, ironically, he had a daughter. So he was like in his early 20s and he had a daughter and he started to, to see how um, how meaningful it is to be a parent, you know, uh, or to travel the world or to do certain things. So anyway, long story short, you know, um, I'm very grateful for the success I've had, but what I really crave is just more experiences. And, and I'm not sure I can't wait for, you know, what the rest of this year holds and, you know, future years. Are there any books that you would recommend our viewers and listeners to 
kind of get them started into an entrepreneurship or just investing in general? Yeah. Um, you know, this is one of the more uh, common questions I get because I, 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 I read it's July and I've already read like eight or nine books this year. Um, it's something, it's my hobby outside of fishing. Um, anyway, people should check out the ultimate sales machine by Chet Holmes and Amanda Holmes. Um, people should, uh, uh, read the book, uh, the magic of thinking big people should check out the book, um, by Eric Reese called the lean startup. And the reason why that book is super important is because it helps you get into the mindset of entrepreneurs in the Silicon Valley. And it, it honestly, the way that they build companies through, you know, minimally viable products and iteration and, and data analysis is something that I was fortunate enough, you know, fairly, uh, it really came after I sold Pepper Jam, but I, I learned it and it was really important as an investor to understand how these types of entrepreneurs think. Of course, I would go on uh, to use that same model to start, you know, multiple companies. Um, those are just a couple of the books. You know, there's um, uh, the other book that I, I recommend and notice that these are all over the place, but is a book called The Secret. Uh, the Secret is is right. is probably the best book out there on the law of attraction. And I'm a big believer that what we think here, what you focus on, your energy flows. So where you focus, your energy flows. So if you could get better, if we all could get a little bit better on focusing on the things that we want, right? If we could almost like believe in manifestation and believe that, um, you know, we're capable, everything uh, we need is within us right now to take that first step towards wherever we want to go. You believe in abundance, not scarcity. You believe that magic happens, not that it doesn't. Um, this law of attraction uh, is something that I um, believe in very strongly, and I think that it could have a positive impact in anyone's life, to, regardless of you know where they might be currently in their life. I think that things could get better. I, I know they can, um, but it starts with a belief that that's possible. And are there three podcasts that you would recommend? I do not listen to a ton of podcasts. I have friends that listen to podcasts all the time. My finance manager, who's right next to me, is listening to podcasts every single day. Um, that said, um, one of my favorite podcasts is the 20 VC. Uh, it's, a, it's a podcast uh, where, um, you know, 20, 25 minutes interviewing, you know, people within the venture capital community. Um, but, you know, other than that, I'm not, I'm not like an avid podcast guy. Um, there is another one called Masters of Scale that I listen to. Uh, that's by Reed um, Hoffman. Uh, he's the founder of LinkedIn. He has an amazing, there's actually a book by that same name. I'm not sure it would make my top five or 10 books, but certainly top 50. Uh, great book by, by Reed Hoffman um, on how to, uh, you know, basically what he calls blitz scale. Uh, a business. Right. So once you achieve product market fit, you have a total, a huge total addressable market. You know, he came up with this concept called blitz scaling, which is pretty, pretty unbelievable. Um, I've never, I'm not sure I've ever been in a blitz scaling, uh, you know, period with any of my companies, not in the way he thinks about it, certainly putting millions of dollars into a startup, you know, annually, but not, you know, hundreds of millions. You know, that's, all right. So thanks a lot for the chat, Chris. Thanks for making it very digestible for me to understand as well. I hope our viewers and listeners kind of also take that same um, advice. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity. And, um, you know, I hope that your, your listeners, you know, find some tidbits of knowledge that, that, that are helpful. Thanks for watching that episode. I hope you enjoyed. For more videos like this, make sure you like and subscribe.